So today I'm here with Kibira Khatak. Perfect. Is that how I say it? Amazing. <laughs> so for the mortals who don't want to try that pronunciation, <laughs> she said Khatak is also okay. So Kibira is from Vancouver. That's right. And actually before I went to Columbia in like 2017, I think she wasn't really dancing with Patrick and Scarlett yet. But when I came back, there were these like two younger girls in the studio that were killing it and Kibira was one of them with her friend Avery and so if you don't know already you are in the presence of greatness there is a world champion Robin Robin sitting beside me <laughs> and what year was that when you when you two won the uh, the world salsa summit yeah, January of 2020. That's right. So there you go. She's got a lot of experience in a very short time and works really hard. So I'm really excited to talk to Kira today. So thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. And we're just out here on a lovely day and we thought we'd get Vancouver in the background to show all of you who are not from Vancouver what it looks like. So here we go. I think the thing that surprised me the most when I came back to Vancouver is I had only been gone, I think, for two years or something. And I came back and I was like, holy crap, like these two girls are really good. And I was like, how did they get good so quick? So obviously the dance dojo, we have online lessons with Patrick and Scarlett and she's practicing with Patrick and Scarlett and we've both been lucky to learn from them, but she mm -hmm. got good really fast. So I'm curious, how did you start your journey? How did you end up dancing with Patrick and Scarlett? And do you think there's anything that helped you get to that uh, performance and win that world championship? Mm -hmm. So how I started, kind of a, an interesting story, I guess. I didn't know anything about the world of salsa or anything like that. Um, I was introduced to it by a high school teacher of mine. He was my math teacher. And he really plugged, oh, you know, you all should come out to the salsa club um, Tuesdays at lunchtime or whatever it was. Yeah. And I thought, oh, whatever, salsa, what is that? I don't care about it. <laughs> And then I thought, oh, what the heck, why not? I'll go once. Um, and then I remember just falling in love with the music. And then he knew Patrick and Scarlett from a long time ago. Um, and then that's when he brought them in to do some classes. Um, I think they did like a five week session or something. And then I met them. And I remember just seeing them and seeing how professional and knowledgeable they were about salsa and what amazing people they are. And I remember seeing a performance of theirs. <laughs> Um, and I thought, okay, this is it. These are the people who I want to be training under. I want to be surrounded by them. Uh, they're amazing at what they do, both on and off stage. And mm -hmm. that was that was a moment for me where it's like I had to I had to start taking classes from them. So yeah. I mean, I feel like we've both been really lucky to learn from Patrick and Scarlett. Uh, I've been in Columbia lately, so I haven't got as much time in the studio with them. But now every time I come back, I, I try and do their classes as much as I can. Uh, and so I also come from a different background. So I guess it sounds like Kabira started with salsa. Is that right? Yeah. I started breakdancing actually first. And in the breakdance world, you kind of just like threw yourself on the floor and tried to figure out everything by yourself. So there's not very many mentors around. So I've seen the difference when someone actually gets mentored by a good teacher that knows what they're doing. So it can either take you five to 10 years to figure something out or one to two <laughs> in, in the case of Kabira. So I think you've been very lucky to have mentors yeah. like Patrick and Scarlett. And I'm curious, like, what did you feel? I mean, maybe you haven't had the other side of having maybe a teacher that's less experienced, but I mean, you've, you've now learned from various teachers, I imagine. Mm -hmm. What do you feel like that's different about Patrick and Scarlett or the way you learned with them? Mm -hmm. I think for me, the biggest difference that I feel with them and that I think you also get to feel on Dance Dojo, which is amazing that you have them, is how passionate they are about what they do and not only about the steps that they're teaching but their students themselves the students themselves um, they really you know they take the time to connect with you and I remember we talked about what are my goals and my goals were performing and competing eventually and improving things like my body movement which I think is what really helps catapult my growth um, and they were they were invested in that they have this really they have this knack this ability to see potential in people and see room for that growth and then they're, they're, they'll take you there. So I've been, I've been really lucky to, to be working with them. Yeah. This is actually Kabira's supposedly her first interview. 
and so I think she's doing great so far. Um, it's also my first interview, so if you're expecting some Joe Rogan or Tim Ferriss level <laughs> material here, it might not happen. Really? But, I didn't know it was your first time either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't think I've interviewed someone before. Really? Yeah. Okay. So here we go. I usually just talk with go. myself. And well. I guess some people listen. So, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, a lot of the viewers, you guys watching, uh, are probably new to salsa or you're either just super salsa nerds and you're all on your own journeys. So I think one of the interesting things is when you're speaking with someone who's kind of got past a lot of those hurdles that we're probably all experiencing in our own way is as asking like what was that journey like for you like what were those challenges or those roadblocks or those plateaus that you've hit so far in your journey obviously it's not over mm -hmm. um and how did you kind of approach them mm -hmm. i would say for me the the biggest plateaus is especially coming from say the followers perspective is for us Thankfully, we're not thinking about the combos per se, or you know what what moves have to come next, and how to how to lead your partner through that. It's more the responding, which is also a task in and of itself, which means that it's a lot focused on your technique. Mm -hmm. uh, which, of course, for the leaders too, but in the sense that there's not as many yeah, not as many moves that we have or different things or compartments that we have to focus on. So what we do have is pretty standardized almost, um, and it's very like you, for example, a cross body lead. We do that probably a hundred million times a night. So if you're not super comfy in your cross body lead, it's gonna come across in other, right. whatever other variations the leader has. Um, so really drilling down on the technique of it. Sometimes I, I remember getting stuck with my, what was it? Oh, double turns is a big one. <laughs> double turns, that, that multiple turn technique yeah. um, and hitting that plateau and going, okay, what is, how am I, like, how do I get past this? Mm -hmm. um, and what helped for me was building, like focusing, focusing on less things, I would say, um, because we're kind of inundated with all this information about all these different techniques and tips and everything, which is super important because they all help us to get that final product. Yeah. But what are, what are one or two things that I can focus on? Because if we try and focus on 10, different techniques at the same time or 10 tips no matter how amazing they are how valuable they are it's just too much for us to take in at times yeah. so focus on one or two um, spend time working with that technique feeling what it's like in your body um, and then when you're ready or if that's not working try taking something else um, and also have patience with yourself because I, I wanted to get things right away I mean I still do I'm like why is it taking me so long to get this step or whatever it is mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it, you just got to get that seed planted in your head yeah. even forget about it and then come back to it and then you'll go oh wow I got it just like that mm -hmm. so cool I think it's really important and if I start getting closer to Kibira it's, it's not because I'm trying to like hit on her or something <laughs> we only have one microphone right so I actually just remembered that and I've been talking this way <laughs> okay. so I'm gonna start talking more towards Kibira <laughs> um, so a lot of people these days you hit on something is like we all want things quick and especially with all the apps, social media, we're just used to getting whatever we want right away. Because for example, I remember when I first started breakdancing, there was like a website, there was no images, there was no videos. We had to read like paragraphs and be like, this is the name of the move. And there's this long paragraph figuring, and I imagine everybody would have um, interpreted that differently and tried something different. And so we've come a long way in being able to get the information we want right away or seeing the world's coolest this or that on Instagram in a second. And so we want everything quick and we expect that we can just learn things that fast and it doesn't really happen that way. So if you can put the instant gratification aside and put mm -hmm. in the work, you'll get the results because a lot of people aren't willing to do that anymore. And a question that I had for you is how in, how much were you practicing solo versus like in a class? Like how important is it to just take that time for you to get everything in your body to mm. push forward? Mm -hmm. Um, super important, I would say, because again, group classes are where you're kind of, you're getting all that information, that technique, but depending on how, you know, how slow or how fast you are at intaking the information and mm -hmm. feeling it in your body and what, what works for you, it's going to, that, that's different for everyone.
So setting aside that time to integrate what you've learned in those group classes, and even if that's just in front of the bathroom mirror, right? Um, doing your rotations for your body movement or practicing spotting, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. um, super duper important. And have you always practiced like steadily or do you kind of have like a spurt of practice and then you kind of chill like do you have a cycle or are you just kind of like going full steam all the time <laughs> full steam all the way <laughs> well okay. I guess when it comes to if we have a competition right. or something coming up then that's that's maybe more practice in a more concentrated practice mm -hmm. um, but other than that no just just being consistent consistency is the is the key here like keyword in bold consistency <laughs> um, you heard it <laughs> heard it right here <laughs> um, yeah even if it's even if it's just a minute a day mm -hmm. right something's as simple as a minute a day doing whatever drill it may be if you're doing that you know a week that turns into two weeks that turns into a month a year whatever it may be that's where you're gonna see the exponential growth yes. so and that's a, there's a lot of people that come up with excuses especially when they're emailing in to me about like the course and like asking questions about it they're like hey I don't have a partner or like they're always like I don't have much time or I don't have a partner so like what would you say to those people that kind of are using that as either a limiting belief or an excuse at this moment Ooh, that's a good one <laughs> um, so that I think it comes down to to your why why are you why are you wanting to learn salsa and it doesn't have to be a super deep or profound reason it can just be oh I want to connect with other people it can be because I want to have fun and if that reason is strong enough for you mm -hmm. then you're gonna prioritize your practice right. and then things such as oh I don't have a partner are gonna fall away and it's gonna become non-existent because yes partner work is a huge component of salsa but it's not the entire thing right. there's a lot of solo work that you can do um, that is in dance dojo as well. So take advantage of it. <laughs> I didn't tell her to do that. So, but, but yeah, it's right. You can work on your basics. You can mm -hmm. work on your shines, which is your solo footwork. You can work on your body movement. You can work on your turn technique. Mm -hmm. And whether you're a leader or follow, you can work on all of those things as well. So there's always something to work on. And mm -hmm. it's way easier to work on that stuff when you don't have a partner beside you because you're not worrying about the partner and you're just worrying about yourself. And then once you worry about yourself, then when you do have a partner, it's going to be so much easier. Yeah. So. And if I just chime in on that, I would say the biggest, I think I mentioned it earlier, but the biggest sort of component that helped me with my growth or kind of sped that up would be that solo work, would be those body movements, those shines, because in shines, you're learning about your weight transfers and your placement of your foot in different positions and to do it with speed. Mm -hmm. And especially for leaders and follows as well, but leaders, you know, getting used to stepping in different directions. Um, that is, it seems so minor, but it really helps you when it comes down to partner work. And body movement for both leads and follows, right? Your leader, your arm technique is coming from your body movement. So if you understand that, when you're alone, it becomes so much easier to integrate that with a partner. And it makes your partner work a lot easier uh, and you kind of grow a lot faster in that regard too, for both leads and follows. And so let's take an intermission from all the serious salsa talk for a second. She recently had a birthday. How old are you now? <laughs> I'm 21. So there you go. 21 year old, also won a world championship already. And I also think you had a medical emergency. Can you tell us more about that? <laughs> Okay, so here I am, fresh 21 year old, okay? Yeah. I'm trying to adult here. Yeah. And I go, okay, I think I gotta go put some laundry away. So I'm going, I'm, I'm walking across, and I guess I'm not paying attention, but all of a sudden the closet door is a lot closer to me than I thought, and boom, there I go. I hit the closet door, it shakes a bit. There's a brief moment of silence, and then I go, wow, that really hurt but in different words. <laughs> and uh, I just had to kind of, I had to stand <laughs> in the pain <laughs> for a couple moments. Ended up having to crawl across the, the, 
the room because I had to get going after that. Laundry was left there, by the way. And then it turns out, fractured, <laughs> fractured my pinky toe. So, so there you go. Yeah. 21 year old, trying to learn how to do laundry, doesn't quite get the laundry into the closet. <laughs> no. And the laundry just went on the floor. Like you didn't, you didn't even make it there. Yeah. Then what happened next? And then what happened next? Well, yeah, the laundry got left. I had, to, I had to leave. I also had to get on the floor. So the laundry and I became one in that sense. And then I left and then I had to go get to practice. And how did that go? Um, it was more, I worked on my imagery, my imagery skills and my, my visualization, I would say a lot. Awesome. And then I also heard there was another member of the team that went down. What happened there? Um, <laughs> I heard it was a shower injury. Yeah. I'm not sure what's going on here. I don't know what's going on. There must be something in the air. But yeah, apparently they were uh, just trying to get ready for practice. It was an early morning practice. Uh, they jumped in the shower. Something happened. I don't know what happened in there, but they come out with a rolled ankle. Yeah. So. All right. Well, Oops. wish you the best on your recovery because <laughs> Thank you. Kabira has like, she's getting ready for Toronto, Toronto Salsa Festival Congress, and has like seven, five choreographies, but she's doing them seven times. There's seven categories that she's going to compete in. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. That's Busy girl. Yeah. Got to so, do what you got to do. <laughs> So, injured toe, hairline fracture, she's going to survive, a little bit of pain, but she's not practicing right now, and it's three weeks away, so best of luck. Thank you, I'm going to need it. All right, going back to, like, your own journey and the, I don't know, I'd just say, like, the challenges you've had along the way. You said, I guess, body movement was one of them, double turns was another. Do you have mm -hmm. any advice for people that are working on body movement or double turns? Like if you were doing it all over again, mm -hmm. like what would you focus on? Make it fun. Mm -hmm. Because often we get super focused on wanting to achieve this certain skill set. And again, back to instant gratification, get it right away. Mm -hmm. It's easy to get frustrated and impatient with yourself. Um, I'm not saying I'm better at that yet, but I'm working on it. Yeah. Um, so make it fun. Like if you're working on body movement, Play some fun music, something as simple as that. Um, and once you're, you know, you spend your time focusing on that technique, let it go even. Just jam out to the music and let your body move without necessarily picking on yourself or judging yourself for how you think you should be moving. Um, and just see what, what naturally happens. And then you might find that the more times you do that practice, that, hey, I'm, I'm actually making some solid improvement and you're doing it in a fun way instead of stressing out about it because when you stress about it mentally that turns into physical stress and then it gets a lot, hurt, a lot harder to to gain what you want to achieve what you want what about double turns what's any any tricks there tricks for the double turns um yeah don't do them so much that you get dizzy and fall over because i have done that many times thought you're gonna say just don't do them <laughs> no no do them do them um you want technical you want technical tips or like how to how to approach it i don't know is there anything that just kind of clicked for you like what or was it just like repetition? To be honest, it was repetition. Repetition and repetition focusing on one, uh, I don't wanna say trick, but one tip at a time. Right. Uh, whether that be, okay, you know what, for the next couple of times, um, my next couple of practice sessions, I'm gonna focus on spotting, just spotting. Get the hang of that, get a feel for that, then focus on, okay, what's the next thing that I can add on to that? Maybe right. it's the stability of your body or whatever, yeah. maybe. Um, just bite yeah. off a piece at a time. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's good advice. If you try and do everything perfect, you're just going to be unhappy and you're not going to feel, you're not going to feel like you're getting the result you want. So just exactly. take it one step at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything else along your journey that you felt like this was a major roadblock for you? Or if you want to answer it in a different way, you do more teaching now than you did when you first started. <laughs> um, you're, you're, she's assisting a lot in the studio. And so through that process of helping others learn, like what, what are the roadblocks that you typically see followers go through? And maybe how would you encourage people to kind of get through them? Mm. Okay. So for the follows, some things are understand the, or recognize, I would say, the importance and the, and the activeness of your role. Because sometimes as follows, we're thinking, oh, it's the leaders who are, uh, you know, well, they have to understand the technique behind leading and we're just kind of meandering along. Right. Um, but no, it's that we have an active role in, in the dance as well. Whether that be your technique of, you know, 
keeping your arms mo mobile or light or um, being active with your footwork and active with your dancing as well. <laughs> Um, it's easy, it, it can be easy when you're in class to go, okay, well, this is just the same kind of combo over and over again. What am I getting out of this as a follow? Right. Um, but there's so much. Like, focus on incorporating your body movement into your dancing, and that's going to make your partner work a lot easier as well on you, for you as a follow. Um, what else? Maybe it's connecting with your leader more. Um, but yeah, find ways to, to still to engage yourself. And there's, there's like tons of ways. Maybe you want to add, you're feeling pretty comfy with that. Maybe the next thing is a little bit of styling. Um, yeah, so find, find, find different ways to still, like, still be active in your dancing, mm -hmm. I would say. Oh, super good tips. And you social dance, you perform, you compete. Do you have a favorite between social dancing, performing, competing? And also, from the performance and competition side, what has that helped you on the social dance side? Mm. In terms of do I have a favorite, I don't actually have a favorite, but I will say that I love, I think they all complement each other really well. Because when it comes to the performing and the competing, um, of course you're, you're working that same routine over and over again because you need to execute it really, really well uh, and technically well. And that can be pretty stressing at times because you're focused on just the, the same thing and you're just going it over and over and over and you're going, man, you know, this is, oh, and there goes the phone. I hope that's okay. I think we're Will still good. Will it survive? Yeah, okay, sweet. I think sweet. we're still good. Keep going. Okay. Um, and so it can be pretty stressing at times. So with social dancing, it's nice to be able to do that as well. Um, and just to kind of let go in that sense where it's not about executing this this song perfectly it's just about connecting with your partner letting go having fun and having the balance of both um, makes it makes me feel like I'm like it's complete in a way right where I have that focus with the with the, with the performing and competing but also just the having fun because that's what I that's that's how I got into it was just to have fun was to connect with people and I think that's probably a pretty common reason as well um, so yeah the balance I love the balance <laughs> That's it. And I mean, one thing I noticed, like, I haven't been on a performance team at all for a very long time, but when I first started with Patrick and Scarlett, I think it was like 2012, 2013, I was in it for like a year or so. And one thing that I, I really noticed about it is just the fact that like when you're drilling something over and over, like, and especially you have that expectation of like, hey, I, I really got to get this down. So it's, it's kind of in addition to the classes where they're more casual. And so mm -hmm. you have a little bit more pressure on yourself, which I think can be good. You know, it's just like a, it's like a healthy stress level. It's not like something that's so far out of your comfort zone, you can't achieve it. But it's like, hey, you know, we've got this competition coming up or we've got this performance coming up. So we got to do a good job. Mm -hmm. And so you're really, really dialing it in and trying to get every technique looking good, sharp. Mm -hmm. But then the other part that I think is really helpful with the performance stuff or the competition is that you're really learning how to present. And so you're going to get rid of like the slouchy, like Mr. Burns from The Simpsons posture. <laughs> and like film yourself and start getting that feedback more actively, which a lot of people when they're learning, I don't think they're filming themselves a lot. I don't think mm -hmm. they're getting the feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're not creating that feedback loop that's gonna help them really move forward. But then as soon as you kind of add that pressure on yourself to compete or perform, you really start filming yourself and checking yourself out. What do yeah. I look like? And that really helps you move forward. And so if I was to go back to starting over again, I would really start filming myself sooner and think about like my posture and how am I presenting myself because if, even if I'm social dancing I I want to make sure I look good because then mm -hmm. I feel like if you're looking good you're probably feeling good totally because <laughs> the, the other side to that is when you're starting this is a big challenge for a lot of people big challenge for me I'm you might have experienced it too is you feel really good when you're doing something and then you film it <laughs> and then you look at the you look at the tape or you look at the you look at your camera and Oh no, She's like, oh, <laughs> I don't feel so good anymore. No, it's a disaster. Like, there's so many people, I, and I know because you've written in, and you say like, I don't want to film myself. And they're like, no, I don't film myself. Because they're so afraid of what they're going to look like. But the sooner you just look at yourself in the mirror, look at yeah. yourself on film, on the camera, you're really 
you're gonna get over that uncomfortableness really quick. Mm-hmm. It hurts, like it, it stabs yeah. you in the heart, like really, <laughs> really hard at first. But then it really helps you take the next leap forward. So I think that was one thing that helped me in terms of the performance stuff. Um, so if you're starting from the beginning, get the, feedla- get the feedback loop going with, the, with filming yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, was there anything else from competing or performing that kind of like helped you to improve quicker or? I would say the, the mentality of it, because yes, it's, it's very physical performing and competing as you know, mm-hmm. but it's also mentally taxing as well because you're under that pressure, like you mentioned. And uh, you got a lot of pressures going on at once. You have, okay, I'm performing it in front of people. What are they gonna think of me? What are the judges gonna, how are they gonna judge me? So you're putting yourself in a pretty, I'd say uncomfortable position for most people. And so how, how mentally strong are you? And that is something that I struggled with and thankfully I had Patrick and Scarlett and they really coached me through, um, you know, overcoming those fears of judgment and okay, how can we, how can, how can we work through this? Because it is a part of competing, not just in dance, but in any other, you know, domain. Um, and so developing that mental fortitude and growing in that aspect uh, really translated to my confidence dancing outside of those those spots. Um, so social dancing, or even just taking a class. Like I felt more, more, yeah, more confident, more mentally strong, <laughs> if you will, mm-hmm. that I could look at myself in the mirror or take a video of myself practicing and be, be able to do that with less discomfort. And then from there, like uh, Robin was saying, you can grow a lot faster because you can notice, okay, what am I, what could I be fixing here? Um, so it definitely helps me get over that uncomfortableness of, of videoing myself because I had to do it in front of people, <laughs> whether I liked it or not. Yes. <laughs> so there's always that, that good extra added pressure. Um, mm-hmm. Again, as long as you can handle it. You always want to kind of be like working just outside your comfort zone. You don't want to push it too far because then you get overly stressed and maybe just like beat yourself up. So just push the comfort zone, but not too, too much at any given mm-hmm. time. Uh, and then how about like, what's next for you? Like what, do you have any big, do, no, doesn't have to be a big goal, no pressure, but any, <laughs> any like goals? Like what do you, where do you see yourself going for the next while in salsa? Next or in while. dance? What are you feeling? Mm, well, I'm really enjoying teaching. So love to continue doing that more. Um, travel a little bit more as well. Get to meet some different scenes. That'd be awesome. Meet some different people. Um, yeah, teaching, com- continue competing. Yep and just grow, grow my skills as a dancer. Like, I'm so excited for what's to come. I can't wait. Nice. Are there any other dances that you've explored or are curious to explore? Well, I did tap for a while before oh, yeah. salsa. Yeah, oh, cool. I did that for like six years. So I would say that helped with the footwork. <laughs> yes, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. Um, other dances, you know what? I want to get into cumbia. Oh, yeah. interesting. I love the music. Yeah. Um, hustle as well. I want to get into that's cool. Yeah, hustle's fun. Hustle is fun, Um, and maybe some hip hop. Yeah, I don't know. Every anything and everything. I'm open. (laughs) I'm ready. Yeah, that's awesome. I think it's really great to be open to other dances. Because like Mm -hmm. one thing, like when I when I was break dancing and learning learning that, we had a crew member and was like, no, you should only break dance. Like you should only learn this. It's like you shouldn't focus on the other things. Like you got to focus on Mm -hmm. one thing. But honestly, after going through that experience and just yeah, dancing more. I think the more things you're exposed to, the different styles, the different classes you take, it all just kind of adds up and you can take those different things and put it into your own style and become more of your own, like develop your own style, develop mm-hmm. your own character as well. And you take those techniques and you can bring mm-hmm. them in as well. So I think yeah. it's super helpful. Uh, last question. So thinking back to where you're at when you're first starting or to anyone who's watching, who's a new dancer, is there any word of advice, any final message that you would like to send them? Yeah. Oof. That's a lot of pressure. Just, That's a lot of pressure. Just one thing. It just, have one to be thing? Five. just one thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> mm. <laughs> if you were speaking to K- Kabira like five, six years ago, what would you tell her? Okay. I would say have patience. Have patience, but I'm gonna I'm gonna do I'm probably gonna say five. <laughs> I'm gonna go more than just one. <laughs> have patience, but stay hungry. Um, keep that fire burning. When that fire dies out, then then your growth kind of stops there. So 
be patient, but keep working hard and surround yourself with people who you look up to and who inspire you. Because whether that be you know, your local teams in your, in your community, or maybe it's teachers, or maybe it's figures, international figures, whatever, whoever it may be, if you're being surrounded by that and, and their success, if you will, um, it makes you hungry to, to, make, to do better yourself. And now you have that fire, now you have that drive, that push, and that's where you're gonna start growing. Because you're gonna want you're gonna want it. And when you want it bad enough, you're gonna make prior you're gonna prioritize it. You're gonna make time for it. And then you're gonna grow. That was really good advice. That was more than one. That was like five. You killed it. Ooh, yes. <laughs> so if anybody around the world who's watching this would like to connect with you, how can they do that? Um, I'm on Instagram. <laughs> Kabira Katak. Wait, can you put it can you put uh, it yeah, here? Yeah, I'll put it on the screen. Oh, oh, yes. right there. Right here. Right there. <laughs> I've always wanted to do that. Yeah, you're doing right here. it. Yes. Um, but I also teach uh, under Patrick and Scarlett at Dance Vancouver Studio. Mm -hmm. So that can be, can that be right here? We'll try and make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> so you're gonna... asking a lot. This is more editing work for me. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> well, thank you for the interview. Thank you. Really appreciate it. My and pleasure. Then...